Well, good morning to each and every one of you. Um, um, as you see me sitting over here, I'm suffering what I think is a sinus infection this morning, but I uh, hope you can hear me okay and hear me well this morning. I'm certainly thrilled to be here. Whether I'm uh, dealing with a, some sort of uh, sinus infection or some sort of problem or not, I'm happy to be here. I want to look at a lesson with you this morning on something that happened with David. I know a lot of times we think about David and Bathsheba, and that's not what I'm going to focus on this morning. That's totally not the topic. I'm going to look at something else that happened with David that I don't hear a lot about. Sometimes people will touch on this, but not a ton. But I want to think about how that sometimes the actions that we take, how it really affects, um, in this case, all those that he was in leadership over, and how that sin can have a great impact on a great many people that are around about you directly and indirectly, depending on what your actions are and what you've done. And this, to begin with, it's in 2 Samuel chapter 24. And we'll start in verse 1 to begin with reading. I'm going to go over to First Chron- Chronicles in just a moment. But uh, to begin with, Second Samuel chapter 24, starting verse 1. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel from Dan even to Bathsheba, Bathsheba, and number ye the people, that I may know the people, may know the number of the people. And Joab, now it's interesting how Joab approached this. So David is telling him to go number the people, yet Joab has a rebuttal to this. And Joab said unto the king, Now the Lord thy, king, thy God, add unto the people how many soever they be, a hundredfold, and that the eyes of my Lord the king may see it. But why doth my Lord the king delight in this thing? Whatever God adds to you, he's going to add to you. You'll see it. What does it matter? What difference does it make how many people are here? You know, a lot of times... We think about uh, big crowds of people. We are boasted in what we think we can accomplish because of the number or numerical value of the people that stand with us. And that is excluded when you think about God. It doesn't matter how many people are standing with you. It matters that God is with you. It makes no difference the number of people. Verse 4, now, Notwithstanding, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the host. And Joab and the captains of the host went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. So although Joab was trying to really talk to David and tell him what difference does it make, it prevailed, of course, David being the king. He's under authority of the king. He had to go, therefore, if David pressed him and performed such an action. In verse 5, And they pressed over Jordan and pitched in Aor, Aor, on the right side of the city that lieth in the midst of the river of Gad and toward Jazir. Then they came to Gilead and the land of Tatim Hoshai, and they came to Danjan and to the end about to Zidon, and came to the stronghold of Tyre and all the cities of the Hivites and of the Canaanites, and they went out to the south of Judah and to Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came in Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave up the sum of the number of the people unto the king. There were in Israel eight hundred thousand valiant men that drew the sword. And the men of Judah were five hundred thousand men. And David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. And David said unto the people, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. Now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. He did. He done very foolishly by numbering all the people. You know, if people were looking at God for their strength, it wouldn't matter if it was two people in Israel standing against an army of individuals of God being with them. It made no difference. As a matter of fact, I'm going to look at a situation like that in just a little bit. But it didn't make any difference. But nonetheless, when they knew the number, you know what can happen when you know the number? When God doesn't want His people numbered, when you know the number, you could look at it and say, well, that army has six million and we only have this. How we're going to fight against them? It can be very dismaying to those individuals that should not be looking at the strong number of the people that are there involved get into God's strength. So David realizing this, and I find it very interesting, because what happened with David before with Bathsheba, 
it didn't occur to him as though it would have when he was told what he had done. And in this case, once it came, it was finished. Once the people was numbered, once he'd been told, he realized what he had done. He realized that iniquity. He realized what he had done. And he wanted, I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the, thy, the iniquity of thy servant. He wanted forgiveness for the sin that he had committed here. He wanted forgiveness of this. Now, we go over to First Chronicles, and it's chapter 21, if you want to turn there with me. And it's interesting here what, they, what is said about Joab. And... 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 6, beginning. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them, for the words, the king's words, word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. Now it's very interesting how that Joab, it says here that his words, and because he, w- he did perform what David was telling him, it says that he went out and he numbered the people. Nonetheless, it says he also didn't count Levi and Benjamin. Counted he not among them. He said that the words were abominable. It was something that was distasteful to Joab's ears to hear David asking him or telling him, ordering him to go out and number the children of Israel. It's very interesting how that he decided that he, of course, he went forward and numbered all these individuals, but how that that was distasteful to him. And it, it should be distasteful. It should have been distasteful coming out of David's mouth to say such a thing, that he would tell Joab to go out and number those people. If we go down and read a little bit further, and well, I'm going to turn over to Deuteronomy. If you want to turn with me, Deuteronomy chapter 7. In verse 6, beginning, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto Him Himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set His love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in number than any people. It didn't make any difference. That wasn't the reason why that God chose them to be a His people. For ye were the fewest of all the people. But because the Lord loved you, and because you would keep the oath which He had sworn unto your heart, unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with the mighty hand, with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen. For the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. It had nothing to do with the large number. There's a lot of nations that were large in number. There's a lot of different nations. You could have went to Egypt and you would have found a very multicultural nation. We can look back in history and we can see how that Egypt had a vast amount of people. It had all different kinds of people there and it was a very diverse set and group of people that wretched a great many lands and had a lot of strength in Egypt. But God didn't choose Egypt. He chose Israel. He chose the people that would fear Him and love Him. But again, we can see here how that not everyone, um, not everyone is going to follow after God perfectly at times. People will do things that will, they will regret. People will do things that will cause them heartache and hardships. And we, I'm going to read a little more and see how this caused a great heartache and hardship, not only for David, but his entire kingdom. It is so important for the leadership to follow what God says. The leadership in a nation can have a drastic, and does, not can, but does have a drastic impact on all the people that they are over governing. We can see how that happened with David. Now, David was a man after God's own heart. David, I'm not taking away from David when I'm reading this, people make mistakes. A lot of times this world will look at individuals who would say that they're a Christian or would say that they're following after God, and they'll say, well, those people, they think they're absolutely perfect and never do anything wrong. To the contrary, we know what's wrong and right. We understand what's wrong and right, but we understand God's mercy and His justice and His long-suffering, and we understand that He can look at us as a people, that we have problems, and He can help us with those problems. It's not that we are perfect but God is perfect, and we want to cling to Him. Nonetheless, I'm going to read a little bit more in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 11, beginning. For when David was up in the morning, 
And the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. Imagine the choice here that David had to make. You think about this. David, he knows that he's done wrong. He's acknowledged that he's done wrong. And Gad is going to go to him. The Lord has told him what to say. Thus saith the Lord. The Lord's telling Gad what to say to David. And he's going to give him a choice. Now, the way that David approaches things is very interesting. The way that he handles things is very interesting. He understood where he was at. He understood where he stood. He understood that he had sinned. Verse 13, So Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee, come unto thee in thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? And that there be three days pestilence in thy land, now advertise... Advice, and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. What are you going to tell the Lord? Gad's talking to David. What are you going to tell the Lord? Here's your options. This is the only options you have. There is no way around this. You have sinned. You have done this. And it was over many months that it occurred. You have done this. You've sinned. Here's your options. Now, I find it interesting because you can contrast the way David acted as a ruler into how that the king or the pharaoh of Egypt acted. When, when you had someone coming to Pharaoh, Pharaoh said, well, and I'm paraphrasing here, who, who is this God that's going to tell me what I'm supposed to do? Who is He? David, he understood who God was. He understood who the Lord was. He understood being humble before God, even when he made a mistake, of course. Being humble, not saying, you know what? I'm, I'm king, I have dominion over this, and I can do whatever he want. He knew better than that. He knew who'd put him in that position. He knew God had set him up there. Verse 14, And David said unto God, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. He approached it correctly. He approached it the proper way. He was saying, Let me fall into the Lord's hand, let me not fall into the hand of, the, of men and tell them what would happen with men. But he trusted God. He did not ever not trust God. He always trusted Him. Even when he made a mistake, he still turned back to God and said, let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for His mercies are great. He totally trusted in God that whatever God said was right. And whatever happened, it was going to be according to His will, of course. In verse 15, So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people of Dan even to Beersheba 7,000 men. That's why I'm saying that sometimes the impact, the sins that men commit, they have a serious impact on those around about us. The different people that are around about us, it did with David here being king, and how that because he had numbered all these people. Now notice that David, what he was doing was numbering all these people, and the number that he had been given suddenly was taken away. Suddenly what he thought, what he had come to number all these people, which was sinful before God, numbering all of his people, and it's fallen away. It's taken away. He's not going to have that. It's going away. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of your eye, the Jebusite. Now, this was something that had had a significant impact, of course, here, because these people, all these people had died as a result of what David had done as a king what he had done and you can imagine the impact it has here he has told Joab to go out and number all these people we've got such a great number of people we've got all these people and suddenly we don't again what he thought he had was taken away if we decide to as a people as Christians if we decide to say oh I've got all these great things look at all these great things I have and not turn to God but turn to that area and look and say oh look at all these great things that I've got over here don't be surprised if it's gone don't be surprised if it's taken away it's diminished because God always wants us to look to him 
not to the things, not to the strength of men, not to the strength we have in our hand, but to the strength that God has. He always wants us to look to Him because that's where we get our strength. That's where we come to for understanding. That's who we are able to. That's why we are able to, and that's who we turn to. That's why we're able to accomplish things. It had nothing to do with the number of people. When they fall against the all the different people throughout the Scriptures we can read about, it had nothing to do with the number of people there. God could accomplish that without one individual stepping up, but we're blessed if we have an opportunity to serve Him. We're blessed if we have an opportunity to work for God because He's able to do it anyway. It's just that He's giving us an opportunity. God was able to rule over all these people, nonetheless, as Brother Rick's been reading about, how they wanted a king. These people could have just turned to God, but they decided to have a king. Well, an earthly king, men make mistakes. When men make mistakes, it has serious implications sometimes and for the entire host of people that they're ruling over. Remember, these people wanted kings. They wanted a king. Well, they got the king. They had kings, and there's a lot of other things we could read about with kings. I'm going to go down and read a little bit more on what David was thinking when this was occurring and what he was saying in verse 17. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? David had oversight over these people. They're following David. Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said unto him, Go up. Rear an altar unto the Lord, and in the threshing floor of Uriah, Uriah and Jebusite, the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. David did exactly what God said to do. Now that was important. It was very important for David not to buck up against this, of course, and say, well, you know, I know I've done wrong, but hey, all these people have uh, been, they've died, so that's enough. I don't have to do anything. No, David was humble when he came to God and said, Please, he's asking and pleading with God to, to stay the angel's hand so that this stops, that these people or no more people are killed because of the sin that David had committed. Remember, David, the sins that he's committing, him being king, have an implication on all the people and reverberate through the entire kingdom, not only through his kingdom, but also all the people that are seeing God's people? Are they obeying what God says? Are they doing what He's told them to do? Now remember, David was a man. I like to remember this. We go over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. David was a man that he understood what God's strength could do. He understood this very well. As a matter of fact, in 1 Samuel, the same individual we're reading about here in 2 Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and Dave, and verse 26, And David spoke to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David knew how to stand against great odds with God. But people make mistakes. That's what I get from this. What I understand from this is people make mistakes. David, when I think of David, I think about a very valiant man that wanted to serve God faithfully, but he made mistakes sometimes. he done things that he ought not, but he was very humble in asking for forgiveness. I'm going to go down and read just a little bit more on the same thought of how David would come against this great odds with God's help. In verse 44, And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He was coming against the Philistine. Of course, Goliath is who I'm reading about here. The Philistine who's asking and asking, and went for a long period of time asking for a champion from Israel to come out and fight against me. He's... The Philistine Goliath is saying, I'm such a great man, and he was a he was the champion of the Philistines. He was a humongous giant of a man. Yet David, nowhere near the size and stature, but having great faith in God, went out to face the giant when the entire army of Israel was cowering behind him. Same David that made a mistake. Same David. Just because you make a mistake doesn't mean you quit. In verse 46, And this day the Lord deliver thee unto, uh, into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head 
from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the hosts of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air, into the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David's going to accomplish that too. Of course, we know we're reading a little more. It says exactly that. He did exactly what he said he was going to do with God's help. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with a sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give un- you into our hands. Now, that was the thought that David needed over there we was reading about. It didn't matter how many swords or spears were there. It made no difference. It didn't make a difference. In verse 48, And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, and David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. I love that. I love reading that. It says that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He ran toward him. He wasn't just walking, moping along, saying, oh, I don't know about getting over here against this guy. Now, I've been running my mouth, but I don't know if I can, I can accomplish this. No, David knew that God being with him, he could. So he was running. He was ready. He just needed to get there to accomplish this task. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone, slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. David hit him with the stone that knocked him down. That's not what killed the Philistine. You read about what David done a little further. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him for there was no sword in the hand of David and therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out and and the sheath thereof, and slew him, and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. They're seeing a very young man here that's going to fight against the Philistine, their champion. No doubt you can imagine you're seeing this giant of a man, the Philistines. I'm thinking about the Philistines' perspective. This giant of a man, and you've got this, this gentleman coming out, this younger guy coming out, and saying, well, I'm going to take care of you today. And you see the entire armies of Israel over there, and even Saul, which we read about Saul, how Saul was shoulders and head above all the other men. Saul was a tall man. He was a, he was a large guy. So he was standing above all the rest of them, and they're all cowering. You can imagine the Philistine looking over and saying, well, this ain't going to last long. you got this little guy coming over here, and he's going to fight against our champion who's massive. He's got these weapons. He's a man of war since his youth up. And then David slays him. Well, suddenly it comes to pass what David said. Suddenly they're listening. Suddenly they are afraid, and suddenly they run away. It didn't matter about the number It was just one doing God's will of the entire army of Israel. One individual, and he wasn't even in the army. You think about that. He wasn't a man that went through training. He was just a man that had faith in God. That's all it takes. That's all that it takes in order to accomplish God's will is having faith and then going forward with it. Not stepping back and saying, I'm not sure, but standing forward and running to the battle running to serve God faithfully. If you go over to chapter 16 in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For the man, for man looketh upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. This is when they were going to, before, right before they chose, uh, when they were choosing another king, and Saul, of course, was no longer going to be in the kingship, and David was going to be chosen at a, a point. And we understand how that Saul, he was a very large man, of course, and how that it was important to pick someone whose heart he was serving God faithfully and not on not on the stature of the man. So we can see how David although was not an impressive man physically, he was not imposing physically, how that he was serving God faithfully. Again, David being chosen of God, he still made a mistake. So we as a people, as Christians, we as a people, we should realize that sometimes we're going to make mistakes. That's one of the things I want to point out today. Sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we are going along and we have started really strong and we come along to a point and we make a mistake, but we don't turn back and fall down and say, I've totally made a mistake and I'm not going to serve God. No, we go to God and we ask in prayer for forgiveness. Sometimes we come before brothers and sisters in Christ, depending on what it is, and we ask them to pray for us and help us to strengthen us. 
it is necessary for us to realize that although men at different times have been very strong into the going into the battle and fighting against evil and fighting against things that are trying to defy God, that sometimes we have moments of weakness. We have moments of weakness and we need God's strength. We come to Him in humbleness. Now, we don't come to Him in boastfulness. Of course, we come to Him in humbleness, realizing that we have made a mistake. If we go over to 2 Samuel chapter 6, I want to read about a gentleman. He was undoubtedly, we can see how that he was doing something that, you know, when I read about this, anyone in my mind, at least I could, I could see myself in this situation. I could see myself here. And I understand when you look at something like this, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7, beginning, how that this could happen to someone. Now, this had greater implications. We read verse 7. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uriah, and God smote him there for his error, and that he died by the ark of God. Now, we can see that the ark was what was happening. I'm going to go back and read verse 6 to set the tone. And when they came to Nichon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. You can imagine as you're going along and it's shaking, he's going to put forth his hand, he's going to take hold of it to steady it, but it wasn't right before God. He made a serious error here. A serious error. And I'm going to read about the implications it had because of what happened next. We see that Uzzah... He was, of course, God smote him and he died, but it says in verse 8, And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And and he called the name of the place Pez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? Because of what Uriah, because of what I had Uzzah, rather, I said Uriah, but what had happened with Uzzah and putting forth his hand and holding this, David was afraid. Great implications. David was afraid to take the ark with him. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him him in that city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obedim, to get out. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed, Obed Edom, the Gideite. Three months, and the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. Obviously, his household wasn't doing something he wasn't supposed to do. He had the ark of the Lord there with him, and he was very blessed. Now, he was doing what he was supposed to do. Now, it was unexpected, of course, as we read here, that where the ark was supposed to be going, it, David would become afraid because of what Uzzah had done, because Uzzah had put forth his hand and he was struck dead. Well, he disobeyed God. Just as we've seen what happened with David, David disobeyed God. When we disobey him, we shouldn't expect to be rewarded for the disobedience. We should expect to be rewarded for the disobedience, not in a good way, rather, but because of what we've done, we receive of the deeds of what we have done. In verse 11, the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obadiah, the Gideon, three months, and the Lord blessed Obadiah and all his household. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obadiah, and all that pertaineth unto him, because the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obadiah into the city of David with gladness. Well, David seen that, okay, it's, it's all right, because David was afraid at that point. David wasn't afraid to fight men of valor. Goliath was a very strong man, a man of war. He wasn't afraid to fight him, wasn't afraid to go to war. We can see that David was a man of war. He didn't care at all to fight. didn't bother him at all to fight. What did bother him was when he was concerned about what God was going to do. He was concerned that something had happened here, and he was afraid. Now he sees that, okay, everything's all right. Everything's all right, so he goes and gets the ark and brings it back. He was... He was okay to do that at that point, but he had pause. Well, that's what happened with Uzzah when he touched that, is that there was a breach brought upon him, and that he died, that implication had brought fear upon David. 
being disobedient to God, our sins that we commit can have a great impact on the people that are around about us significantly. And it did here. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 4, if we go back there, and it talks very plainly about how that if you are doing well, well, you're going to receive of that. And if you're doing bad, you're going to receive of that. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 5, very early on, we can see in human history, it's writing about, we can read about what was written down for us regarding Cain and how he approached things incorrectly, but nonetheless, we can learn from that. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 5, But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And it's talking about the Lord had no respect unto his offering, what he had done here. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou dost well, shall thou not be accepted? And if thou dost not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Sin is going to be brought forth if you're committing evil acts. The reward of those sinful things lieth at the door. But if you do good, you're not, aren't you accepted? And that's what the Lord was saying to Cain here to make him understand, to bring to his mind that if you're doing well, you're going to be accepted. But if you're doing sin, it's not going to be acceptable. Unfortunately, Cain did not heed the advice. Verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him, the first murder. You know, look at this thinking how the God has given him advice. The Lord is giving him advice on what he could do, what he should do, and what's going to happen otherwise. But then... Afterwards, Cain slew his brother. Now you talk about the impact that that had on the world. That was the first murder. The first murder perpetrated by mankind was right there. Now that had a great impact on the generations that come forward, on the generations going forward, on the acts of individuals and what they have done. That was the first act of murder. Now we see many times where people partake of murder. The people in this life, they've committed acts of murder. And a lot of times people don't realize at the time what an impact those things have. Significant. It's hard to comprehend and put into words sometimes how that, that act, that sinful act, how it impacts generations of people going forward. And of course it did here. Not only did it affect Abel, of course, being slain, but it also affected Cain and the punishment he received because of it. And it was a just punishment based on his actions. If you go to 2 Kings chapter 19, in verse 35, And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Now I brought that out because of the thought, that fact, that we can understand how that even if we aren't involved in the process and these this battle, that God is able to overcome regardless. Again, we're just blessed if we have an opportunity to partake, to help God, to work for Him, to be a part of His plan. Because God is still able to perform even if man decided to be completely rebellious. In 1 Corinthians, I'm going to turn over there and read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, we can think about, and I always like to think about how that the crowds of people make no difference when I think about Noah. Noah was one of the best examples I can think about of how the crowds of people make no difference in that there was only eight souls that were saved. At that time, all the rest of the world was totally destroyed. But nonetheless, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 8, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Again, when people commit such things, when people do things that are contrary to God's will, they are going to receive a just reward, not what they want to receive sometimes, but a just reward for the acts that they've committed, and they have serious implications. All sin has a variety of implications. It's not just what you're doing at the time, but it has serious implications later on for the people around about you and for yourself going forward. Case in point, if someone were to lie, and this is just a simple example, if someone were to lie, people, people make fun of this at times, they laugh at this thing, and people bring themselves into a situation they ought not, they don't need to, 
when people say, oh, and I've said this many times before, well, if your wife asks you what you think about such and such food, what are you going to say? You should tell her the truth. Otherwise, you may be eating that food for a long time. <laughs> because she thinks that you like it, so she fixes it every day. Well, it was a sinful thing to lie and tell her it was good when it wasn't. But you're going to be continually subjected to that over and over and over. You tell the truth. That was just a minor example. There's many other things that I could bring up, but I know that we can identify with that because in our society, people will, a lot of times they laugh like, well, you better tell her it tastes good. You know what kind of problems you're going to have otherwise? Well, you tell the truth. You tell the truth because if you're in a relationship where you have a loving spouse, a husband and wife, they understand that when they ask a question, they're going to get a truthful answer. And that's what we always want to be as a truthful people. Ephesians chapter 6, if you want to turn there with me, and read verse 12 beginning. This is why when we commit acts, when we look at things that are sinful, this is how these great implications occur. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, therefore having your loins girded with the, with, about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. When we wrestle against things, whatever the case may be, whatever the sin is, it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan tries to entrap us and put us in situations that cause us a lot of turmoil. And if we stick to the truth in Scripture, we can make our way out of it. We can apply the Scriptures, not man's logic, but the Scriptures in the capacity that will allow us to navigate through those treacherous waters. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, if you want to turn there with me. <clears throat> In verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That would encompass everything that we have to do and everything that we should do, no matter what the situation is. People will often say this, and you hear it in the world, they'll say, well, if you're, I understand that you're a Christian, but when you're here, you shouldn't apply those things, or you shouldn't be a Christian, in other words, what they're saying. You shouldn't bring that into this place. You shouldn't, you shouldn't quote scriptures into this place. <laughs> uh, Christian, there is no taking the Christian out. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian, you're a Christian all the time. You apply being a Christian all the time, no matter where you are, no matter what you find yourself in, you apply God's Word. If you can't, there's a problem. If you can't apply God's Word to the situation, there's a problem because in every situation we find ourselves in, even as David found himself in a situation numbering the people or fighting against the Philistine or seeing Bathsheba, you have to apply God's Word. What should have happened with Bathsheba? He should have turned his face away. What should have happened what, and did happen with Goliath was he went out and he fought Goliath. That was a perfect example of a man having faith at that time, doing what God said, was able to overcome those situations. And he was, and forever has been written down in the Scripture for us to learn of that situation and what should occur. It's very interesting to think about that, how that your actions in a minute space of time affect generations and did for him as an example for us to learn of. Now, David's life was an open book. You think about this. It was an open book for us, and it is right now. It's an open book. All of the things he's done, whether we see good things he's done or bad things he's done, it's an open book for us to read about that. You think about that. Would you? How would you think about that in your life if your life was an open book? No doubt we can see that David was ashamed of things that he'd done that were sinful, but he wanted forgiveness. He didn't just say, well, I've done these sinful things. I, I've done these sinful, awful things, and it just ended with that. No, David was repented, repentative. He would go to God and ask Him for forgiveness. God has written these things down, whatever it may be, the good things, the faithful times, or when David made a mistake for us to learn from David and apply that to our own life, that if we should find ourselves in those situations, if we should find ourselves that we have fallen short, we come to God in prayer. Ask for forgiveness. Now, sometimes the situations we find ourselves in, it may be advantageous 
physically to stay in those lies. But spiritually, it's damnable. Spiritually, it's not. If someone were to be lying to get great gain, then it would be better if they lost all of it and come to God in prayer and repented of those things to serve God faithfully. As a matter of fact, it's First John it's chapter 1, verse 9. It refers to this. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful. That's the difference there. If we confess our sins, if we're willing to come to God, if we're willing to come to Him and ask for forgiveness, it says He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we're willing to, far too often people are not willing to. They'll have this thing in their life and they'll say, you know, I've committed this sin. It's nothing new. Whatever the sin is, it's nothing new. People think that a lot of times. They'll think when they've committed some kind of sin, they're the only ones that's ever done that. Not even close. In our generation by this point, there's been so many billions, maybe trillions of people that have lived before us throughout history. There's nothing we can do that's new. The sins we've committed, it's not new. People have done that before us. People have also found the right way through God's help, showing them how to get those sins removed. It's always turning to God. It always points to Him. This last couple of verses I want to read for you this morning on this topic is Romans chapter 12. In verse 1, beginning, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It is a reasonable service to, for our bodies to be in subjection to God, to be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, so that we are in a line with what God says, so that we're not outside of His will. You know, a lot of times people will, they will all their life, and it's such a shame, all their life they'll be outside of God's will, they may think they're not, but they are. They'll say that, you know, I want to partake of all these sinful things my whole life. And, but when it comes to troubles and trials, they'll say, well, I know that God is perfect and He's merciful and I don't have to worry about those sinful things. But the Scripture tells us that we must confess those sins to have forgiveness of those sins. It's not something that we can be flipping about. It's not something that we can take lightly. Just as David, he did not take it lightly. He did not take it lightly when he committed the sin, when he had numbered all the people. He did not take it lightly when he uh, come to his self and realized that he had committed sin before God with Bathsheba. He did not take that lightly. He was very much humble knowing that he had sinned before God. Not saying, I haven't done anything wrong, but saying that he had. That he had done something wrong, that he needed forgiveness. Just as in our life, as we, throughout this life as human beings... We need forgiveness of sins. I want to read this Scripture for anyone that's not a Christian so they can obey the Scripture, so they can have that forgiveness of sins. We can't say in our life that we don't need Christ because we have sin. We do. Therefore, the, all those people that are outside the ark of safety need, need His blood applied to them. It says here in Romans 10, 17, So the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Luke 13, 3, just what I've been talking about a lot this morning. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Romans 10, 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Two different situations. We don't want to find ourselves in a situation of being lost when we leave this life, but we want forgiveness. People want forgiveness in this life a lot of times. They seek it in many places. Sometimes people have done wrong to you and they'll come and ask for forgiveness. Make sure you forgive them. And sometimes we go to people and we ask for their forgiveness. And we want their forgiveness, of course. But the ultimate forgiveness that we need is from God. So we come to Him and don't rely on what man says, we rely on what he says, so we can be cleansed of those sins. He's faithful and just to do that if we're willing to obey him. 
Thank you for your times. We come together and sing a selected song.